so far we have been looking at uh, different learning algorithms where the q function is stored as a lookup table you know so basically what we mean by that is that uh, so for every state yes right i'll have a table like this right and then for every state yes i'll have q s comma a1 q s comma a2 and so on so forth right so for s1 i'll have that s2 s3 i'll have entries so this is essentially what we mean by a lookup table right so so far we have been looking uh, making the assumption that the value function whether it is q or v is stored in this kind of a lookup table format so if it is value function in v that you are storing right then you would have just the v of s like this here right then for each one s1 s2 you will have this remember the grid world we drew and then we, we filled in the value function for every state in that right it will actually be stored like that it is not just the result of the computation the value function itself will be stored like that that is the assumption so far right the assumption has been that we are using a lookup table right. but then when we were talking about uh, you know various approaches including the maximization bias and dub, uh, double q learning i was telling you that uh, you know this kind of uh, assumption that uh, we have this table is not something that is sustainable and nowadays everybody is using function approximation to get that right so today we will start looking at function approximation in more detail right so why do we need function approximation right so if we store things as a lookup table like we saw in the previous slide right if you have very large number of states or very large number of actions then the table will become pretty big especially if you have large number of states and action and you are learning the q function then you are going to have a huge table right so they are not memory efficient is one part right but then nowadays memory has become so cheap right so if you can actually store something if you really need to store a table uh, that are several gigabytes uh, large you can store it i mean there is enough uh, architectures out there with terabytes of ram itself uh, that uh, you know this is not quite an ob uh, you know objection right um, so you can you can you can get away with uh, that still of course it's still an inefficient way of storing things especially when we start talking about some of the uh, very large state space problems like protein folding and other things that we are able to solve nowadays right uh, the second part is about uh, this continuous uh, states and action spaces right you can't even define a uh, table right unless you discretize the continuous state and continuous actions into bins so what we mean by continuous space we already have looked at this right so we said there's a two byte uh, two dimensional uh, uh, workspace which we then discretized into grids and then we did our grid world and solve problems there right so we already have looked at continuous states uh, where where we do this some kind of discretization but then there are other things like this uh, you know cart pole problem and uh, other kinds of uh, simple examples where the space is continuous and classical control would have solved it treating the state variables as continuous variables and we would like rl to do the same in such cases we will have to come up with a different mechanism for storing the value function and the uh, well the state value function and the action value function right so so we need to have a different mechanism for handling uh, uh, continuous states and actions right and the third component which i think is very important right is what i call as data sparsity so what we mean by data sparsity so if you think about it what does q learning and sarsa and the td and all those approaches say is that for every state or every state action pairs you need to take many 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 different samples right before you can be sure that that value function has covered converged right you have to take many samples and make multiple updates before the value function has converged so that would mean that especially when you are with a large states and action space the exact same state and the exact same action has to be taken many 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 times right so even if i give you like a, a million games of atari games right or any of the other uh, problems that we have looked at uh, to get multiple repetitions of the state action combination the exact state action combination when the state spaces are very large right is going to be difficult so what happens when i am doing this uh, uh, tabular lookup is for each state and action pair i am going to have a separate entry right so that entry gets updated only when i actually experience that state action pair 
Okay, Does that make sense? So, it is like saying that okay, you are playing this uh, large video game and for me to you know learn uh, for how to behave in a particular situation, I should have seen that situation many, many, many times in the past. So, that is what we are saying, right. So, that is not going to be possible, right. That is why I call this as the data sparsity problem, right. So, with all the samples that you are drawing, right, so you do not have enough data to learn efficiently on a given problem, okay. So, we have to worry about uh, how would you handle that. But then if you think about it, let us say that uh, I have this, uh, this domain, right. So, I have some problem, let us say that let us say we are playing Pong, right. So, the ball is here and there is a thing here, right. Whether the ball is here or the ball is or the ball is here, right, it is not going to make a huge difference in terms of the value functions, right. And likewise, if the if the paddle is here or if the paddle is here, right. So, this is the paddle, right. So, so the, the two locations of the paddle, maybe I should draw that in a different color. Right, the red paddle and the blue paddle is not going to have very big difference in terms of what the value function is. Likewise, the red ball and the blue ball is not going to have a very big difference in terms of what the value function will be, what should be the optimal action, right, what is the value function and so on and so forth, right. Because of that, we really do not have to potentially, potentially, we do not have to make different entries for these two states in the uh, 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 in, in your uh, value function representation. So, you could have some kind of generalization going on, right. You could have some kind of generalization going on that allows you to, uh, you know, learn about one situation, right, like the blue position by having had experience with the red position in the state space, right. So, to overcome this data sparsity problem and also the problem with uh, the memory and so on and so forth, I can use a more compact parameterized representation, right, that allows me to do generalization. So, the generalization is in fact the biggest win that you get by doing function approximation. So, even though we can talk about it as, uh, you know, addressing the memory efficiency problem, looking at the continuous state space problem and also the data sparsity problem, right, but this generalization wherein you are going to say that similar states and actions are going to have similar uh, values and therefore, I can generalize between them without having to repeat the same action again and again, right. So, this generalization is what gives me the, uh, uh, what is the biggest advantage you get from using function approximation, okay. So, what we mean by function approximation? So, instead of storing uh, say f of x, right, as a table, right. So, here is x, then f of x, right, so you can store it like this, right x equal to 1 and then you have f of 1 here, x equal to 2, then you have f of here, blah, 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 whatever is the value, right. f equal to 1, you have 1, f equal to 2, you have 4 and so on and so forth, right. So, that could be your uh, way of storing f, right. Alternatively, you can also store f of x in a different manner, right. f of x equal to some alpha times x plus beta times x square, right. So, now what are your parameters here for this parameterized representation? Your parameters are alpha and beta, right. So, given the data that you have seen so far, what will you say is alpha and what you say is beta, right. So, this is basically x square, right. So, your alpha equal to 0, beta equal to 1, uh, that gives you this fit. I mean, just for these two, that is the simplest fit that you could potentially have, right. Okay, so, basically that is the idea behind parameterized representation. So, I am going to take a function f of x and represent it in some functional form, right. So, this is what the functional form we chose was a quadratic. I said alpha x plus beta x squared. So, you could actually do something with alpha x plus beta x squared plus some gamma, right. So, your alpha, beta, gamma are your parameters, right. Uh, just to avoid confusion with the uh, a x a x plus b x square plus c. Okay. So that that a b c are your parameters. So you could you could define it like that, right? So what is it that you you represent using this uh, kind of a parameterized form? Anything. Typically, 
we think about representing value functions in the parameterized form right so far we have been looking at learning the v and the uh, q right and q star and from which we get the optimal policy right so you could think of representing the value function in this parameterized form that's easy you could also think of representing the policy right the pi right in some kind of a parameterized form right so you could do that while you are learning the uh, value function you are also representing the uh, policy or as we will see later we can explicitly represent the policy in terms of parameters and try to find out what is the right value that for set for the parameters so you could have a parameterized representation for the policy also right so when i say parameter representation remember what it is right so it's i'm going to take in some functional form of the states and actions and i'm going to use that to represent the uh, uh, the function right so so like uh, it could be a quadratic could be an exponential could be fourier expansion could be a neural network right so i'll take the take as input uh, the state s yes, and the action a and give as output q s a and it could be a complex neural network could be a support vector machine could be a decision tree so or like we looked at simple quadratic expansions or even linear expansion and so on and so forth right uh, so it so it doesn't matter what we are talking about here okay finally you could also represent the model itself right the transition probability and the rewards and other things that we have we can represent the model itself as a parameterized representation in some cases you would want to have a model that is differentiable right so we all know what is a parameterized uh, fully differentiable parameterized representation yeah so neural network right so you could define your model as a uh, as a neural network and then uh, find the derivative of the mo model with respect to some parameters and then use that for your updates and so on so forth. there are many many ways in which you can use these parameterized representations okay